Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Welcome again. And I have this repeated privilege of being able to sit with you and hear a story of how the Holy Spirit, the work of God's grace, grace touched someone and draw them, drew them on a, a closer walk with Jesus Christ towards a destination that uh, they rarely saw coming, and that's the Catholic Church. And tonight we have a return guest, Matt Leonard, former Methodist. Uh, he was a guest on the program, oh, about five years ago. So, right. Matt, it's wonderful to have you back. It's great to be back, Marcus. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to catch up with you. I love to have previous guests on the show, besides the fact you remind me your, your journey, which I'll just let the audience know that the first episode, of course, is available on EWTN.com or on YouTube. And, but to hear what you're doing, because you've been involved with some really great stuff. Uh, you, you know, uh, we'll talk about the Mary Project and the Salvation Project, and now the, and the excuse me, the sacraments, and then now, uh, which I think just is coming out. That's right. Even as we speak on salvation history. That's right. It's called Genesis to Jesus. It's, All right. It's Lent, yeah. That's awesome. We'll talk about that. But also your new thing, which I didn't even know about, uh, but the Next Level Catholic Academy, to find out that's what you're dedicating yourself for now, so that's really that's right. good. But uh, uh, whenever I have returning guests, though, I don't presume the audience has ever heard your story before, so let me put it back into your plate, and let's hear your how the Lord brought you to the church. The Lord's been really good to me. Yeah, it's funny. I, I just celebrated my 20th anniversary as a Catholic this past Easter, and, and it's been such a whirlwind. <laughs> and you look back and see where you came from and where you are now, and I'm a pastor's kid. So never in a million years that I think I was going to be sitting on a show talking about my conversion. But my dad was a Methodist pastor, as you mentioned. And then he had kind of a, a Holy Spirit conversion and became Pentecostal. So we were four square for a while, and he was an associate didn't, pastor. Didn't most of the Pentecostal movement come out of the Methodist Wesleyan? Well, you got me, because I really wasn't paying attention oh, back then. I was okay. just a kid, I really. Gotcha. Okay. And right. uh, it was obviously a, a, a crazy, kind of a crazy shift for me as a kid because you're in a, a kind of a liturgical environment as a Methodist, and I would serve as an acolyte at the at the services, and then you're in a four square environment, which is like you know it's almost no holds barred, and we're opening every service with you know bring the old time power, and uh, we did that shift, and there was a church split as there often is, and uh, we ended up kind of just making this movement through various different denominations. Uh, Your dad still pastoring? Or? He re he stopped pastoring at that point in time for a period of time, and now he's a congregation pastor. Is so, he really? Yes, he is. He's still pastoring. He's 80 years old, and uh, he is still pastoring. He's a great guy, very holy man. But uh, we did all kinds of stops, you know, the open Bible churches and, yeah. and uh, charismatic churches, and they, my parents put me in a, a Calvinist high school while we were in a charismatic church, and so it was, you know, kind of at loggerheads, and Willow Creek Church in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, so I, I just kind of You moved. had it all. I did. I was like, Everything but Catholicism. <laughs> Everything just about. In fact, <laughs> the last stop I made before I became Catholic was this kind of, it was a church that almost kind of played at Catholicism. It's kind of this Anglo-Catholic church called Church of the Resurrection. And the liturgy was almost identical to Catholicism. Yeah. It's it very interesting. And it kind of prepared me, I think, for my move. But that's really what propelled me, I think, into the arms of Holy Mother Church. Because you have such a wide variety of background of being kind of a Protestant mutt. And if it's sola scriptura, right, the Bible alone, which I is what I was wondering what it was that tied all those different groups together well, that, as your parents were jumping from here to here. Was it just a real commitment to Jesus? Or uh, yeah, no, they're very strong, very strong Christians and always dedicated themselves yeah. to kind of, you know. But theology wasn't. Theology was crazy, right? Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I almost shouldn't, shouldn't say crazy, but it was all over the map. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm getting things, I'm getting free will at my church while I'm getting double predestination at my high school, you know, and the kind of kid that I was, you'd play them back and forth against each other. You know, my pastor said, you know, you tell it to your teacher in school and they'd argue and they never even met, you know. <laughs> so I would do that, but it didn't, it didn't really bother me for the longest time because, you know, as long as you're in church and when we were in church a lot. Uh, you know, I go to daily mass now, but I was in church four or five times a week growing yeah. up just because of Thursday night and Wednesday night and all the Sunday services did, and all the rest. Did you have Christ? I had Christ. So you had, you had encountered our Lord. Oh, absolutely. I, 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 was, I was a kid who was very zealous uh, for the faith. Now, obviously, it waxed and waned just like any normal kid, right? But I knew who Jesus was, 
and I'd probably been saved about 152 times, you know, a summer camp or, you know, whatever. But I loved the Lord, and, and I wanted to be good. And that doesn't mean I was perfect by any stretch, but certainly I had encountered the Lord. And my family fostered that. And a lot of times when I talk about my, my, my conversion story, Marcus, it's not a matter of, you know, uh, now that I'm Catholic, I'm right and they're wrong. It's not that. It's the richness that you find in Catholicism. You want everybody to have a you know, piece of this, right? Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel in looking back on where I came from. All these different varieties of things that I was involved in brought kind of little pieces to the puzzle, but lots of times, you know, they conflicted with each other. And, and that's really what kind of pushed me into the arms of the, the Catholic faith. You know, as I think about where you're, you're moving now, with this next level Catholic Academy. We're gonna talk about that in a while, but a lot of it has to do with spiritual, a deeper spirituality. Mm -hmm. As you look back on that early life, and now that you understand Catholic spirituality, you look at that early life and, and where you were at in your heart, and even the fact that, you now I wasn't perfect, but I wanted to be. Well, isn't that interesting? I, I wanted perfection, right? But I didn't have a path to get there. Yeah. And because you, you say the sinner's prayer or, you know, whatever it is, and Lord, I rededicate myself to you, you know, right. when, you know when you go up to summer camp or whatever, the altar call. And by the way, isn't it funny we called an altar call? There was never an <laughs> altar, right? You know, it's a total Catholic right. hangover. But uh, I wanted to be good. I just didn't know the path in order to get there. And there was nothing. I had the Bible. Yeah. You know, you say the prayer, they give you your Bible, and, and you're kind of off to the races, except... There's no flesh on the bones, so to speak. I didn't know how to become better. And you also had a conflicting theologies as to whether you had to. That's exactly right, because the Calvinists were saying, well, you're either you're in or you're out, right? It doesn't matter what you do. And by the way, you're totally corrupt to begin with. And then you've, the, the pastors of my church is saying, well, no, you have free will. You can choose the Lord and you can lose that salvation once you choose it. And so... I, I didn't know which really way to go, yeah. and I was kind of schizophrenic yeah. in, in the midst of all in this. In the midst of that, another thing that crossed my mind is that some of those groups say, um, yes, you have reason, and you ha it's good for you to be able to explain why you believe and to do apologetics. Some of those groups know right. you, you can't do that. You don't have the ability. Mankind doesn't have the ability to reason his way to God. And if you do, that's a philosophy of man. That's a bad thing. Right. I mean, you're as a young man getting all that stuff on top of all. Right. And I didn't know which way to go. Yeah. And, and that's why I think um, it hit me one night in a, in a cafe in Wheaton, Illinois, of all places. Okay. You know, and uh, Wheaton is, I live in Steubenville now. I like to say that Wheaton's kind of the Steubenville of the evangelical yeah. world, you know? Yeah. And I was having a cup of coffee with some friends and it was, I had met some Catholic people for the first time in my life who were going to my Calvinist high school. And we're having a conversation and someone brought up baptism. I think it was probably me because I was starting to read some Catholic literature. And, you know, was it necessary for salvation? Was it infants or adults? Was it sprinkling or was it immersion? And it became very obvious very quickly None of us agreed. And so I kind of asked the elephant in the room question, how in the world do we know who's right? And I had all this stuff in my head already from all these different denominations that I've been a part of. And you know, people could whip out different Bible verses like John 3, 5 or Romans 10, 9 or whatever and, and kind of back up their own position. And finally I said, look, someone's gotta be right. There's gotta be, is it necessary or is it not? And, and someone said, well, we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. And I said, yeah, you got him and you got him and you got him and you got him and I got him and we all disagree. So what are we gonna do? And that really was the seminal moment for me mm. because the big issue for me, the big domino that fell was authority. Yeah. How do we know? Because this pastor was disagreeing with this teacher and was disagreeing with that pastor. And by the way, I could split off and go start my own church, which my dad did at one point, you yeah. know? And so really the, the authority yeah. issue was the big thing that pushed me. And it was a long process, don't get me wrong. I never thought I was gonna be Catholic. But once that domino falls, it's a very slippery slopes into the arms of Holy Mother Church. Our, our guest is Matt Leonard. You know, I'm trying, it's been many years since I was back at that same spot, as it is for you, to try and, and put ourselves back there and try to remember how we love Jesus Christ, we love Scripture, and we believe in the Holy Spirit's guidance. But how did we explain the denominationalism right. of Christianity. How did we 
because we, we recognize there is utter confusion and contradictory of this, use a great word, cacophony of voices that each believe they have the Holy Spirit interpreting the Bible correctly, but they do not agree. I just recently read a book by a great Protestant uh, historian, Mark Knoll, uh, on uh, the, old, the old religion into the new world. It's his kind of history of Christianity coming into America and describing step by step how the faiths were affected by the American idea of freedom and all these different ideas. And he explains that whole thing, but at the end of it, I want to say, but, but how do you explain, explain it? Right. Is it of God? Right. This confusion. And I don't remember how we dealt with that. Back you know, then. I didn't deal with it for the longest time because I think in the way that I was raised anyway, especially from a young age of bouncing from denomination to denomination, again, as long as you were in church, it, it didn't really matter. Because I, yeah. I wasn't one of those purebred Baptists, you know, my daddy was Baptist, my grandfather was Baptist. It wasn't like that. And if you're not Baptist, you're not going to, to heaven. It wasn't like that at all. Because my parents were bouncing around, I was bouncing around, and so many of the people I knew bounced around. Then it, what, you didn't really address this question, at least I didn't, until I became a little bit older. But once you start to have your eyes open to it, there is no answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, it's interesting. Your, your dad would have been almost the first generation that started to bounce around a lot. Mm. You know, our grandparents, if they were Methodist, they stayed Methodist no matter where they moved, Presbyterian, Congregationalist. But this idea, of, and then now the next generation doesn't. Re, there's no idea of staying at the same church. You know, you would go to a new town, you find the best preacher or the best child care or the best parking lot or whatever it is. That's how you choose your church. But, but you were a PK brought up in. It's interesting. Yeah, it, it, we, if we have more time to talk about the unique, specific as a PK brought up in a family that bounced all over the place. It, it's interesting looking back now, and you say. Do you see, I do this now, I look back and I say, were there elements of Catholicism that I saw in some of the churches in which I was part of? And it struck me one day that Willow Creek Church in particular, for whatever reason comes to mind, because I was there for about three years and, and I was just mostly going there because you know, they had a great youth program, you know, and so you're, yeah. you'd go to Wednesday or Thursday night and that was kind of your teaching night, then you go to the youth stuff and that was kind of my church at yeah. the time, you know? But isn't it interesting, Marcus, when you look back to see the kind of Catholic hunger that's there that you don't even recognize when you're in it because they built this massive campus, they called it, right? Yeah. And they'd have 200 tables in the atrium and they would encourage people to stay after and eat with each other. And so it dawned on me one day after I'd become Catholic, here we were going into the, the church service, we're having the word, right, open right. to us, the liturgy of the word, and then we're going out to eat and they wanted us all to hang together. And it was kind of like this small s sacramental thing. And so there, I recognized that there was this intrinsic desire that I already had, that all these churches were trying to recreate in a kind of a way, and we didn't even know what it was we were trying to recreate. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, I look back now and I'm like, man, I, I was on this road looking for something and I didn't even know what it was until I got to the church. We talk about the, the, the grace that comes from baptism at, as, a, as a seed of the gifts that we receive through the Holy Spirit and the fruit that's supposed to come out of that, right? You know, love, joy, peace, patience, that long list of, that, that, that's supposed to grow out of that baptismal right. grace that's there. And it's a seed. And in a way, what you're talking about is that our, our separated brethren through their faith and baptism have these seeds. Absolutely. That they want to grow into fruit, but often the, the guidance isn't there to help them understand this is the direction as opposed to now you don't want to go over here. And when, you're, there's, when there's a thousand voices out there. It, <laughs> you know, Garagou Lagrange talks about this, how, how baptism, it's like the seed of... of deification, right? It's the yeah. seed of eternal life that we receive with those graces. And even though I didn't have a theology of baptism, a, a, a Catholic theology, still it was a Trinitarian baptism and it was there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yet, what I, in looking back, there was, and I don't want to say it was bereft of any growth spiritually, because certainly we had growth spiritually, but you couldn't couch it in the same terms that we do as Catholics. And so I look back 
And I was always wondering, what am I going to do next? Like, how am I, how long am I supposed to feel guilty when I sin, right? <laughs> what can I do about that? Is it the next morning because his mercies are new every morning and so I don't have to worry about what it is I did the day before? Um, how do, what, what do I do to, to deal with that sin and move on into a virtuous life? But we didn't talk about virtue in the yeah. same way. It just wasn't part of the vernacular. The way that you grew in the spiritual life, yeah, you'd pray and, and you'd go to church and you had to make sure you're there, but it was also how many people were you kind of bringing into the faith? How many people were you evangelizing to bring in? And it's interesting as you sit back and you look, pastors aren't even in a way kind of like the highest echelon in my, my Protestant background. It was missionaries. <laughs> they were the, the cream of the crop. If your kid was a missionary, you must be doing something right, you know, and, and you go on and you want to evangelize other people, which is great, you know, we want to evangelize other people. I just didn't know what to evangelize them into because my yeah. background was such a potpourri. Now, you, you did spend time as a missionary. I did. I went to Latin America for about 14 months. Wow. And, and that was an experience because at that point in time, I'd already started moving down the road toward the church because that Calvinist high school I went to, I, there was one Catholic family I met there and they were just devout Catholics. All their kids went to Franciscan University. So they knew their faith. They lived their faith. And, uh, and they were a real challenge to me. And the mother of this family, Eileen Vogel, was all too happy to feed me books, you know, whenever I would ask questions. It was kind of like <laughs> Scooby <laughs> Snacks for her. And uh, I started to have questions. And when I made my move to go to the mission field, I'd read enough to, to know something's wrong, right, in the way that, that I was raised. And yet, when you get to a completely different culture, like Guatemala, where I first was, and then Mexico, you encounter a completely different kind of Catholicism than what we have in the States. And there were some things that I, I saw, which some kind of syncretistic things that you'd see there that really bothered me a lot. And I kind of decided to put my Catholicism on hold or any move in, in thought process on hold. The problem was I would go by these Catholic churches and knowing that, that God might be in there for real, I was drawn to these places to go pray. And so here I was, a, a you know, white Protestant missionary, the smack dab in the middle of Mexico, and I would sneak into these Catholic churches every now and then just to go pray and be in the presence of God. And that was a fantastic thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it wasn't that you didn't believe that God wasn't there in your local church. Right. It's just in a different way, in this new way of understanding the physicality of Catholicism. I'm not even sure Catholics always realize how radically different that is. Look, the, the, the church that I grew up in for the most part, this charismatic church, was an old gymnasium. And we had those old felt banners, you know, over the basketball hoops <laughs> to kind of hide those. And it was an orange shag carpet, you know, stage. And so aesthetics and the, the, there were no smells and bells, right? It, that just didn't exist. It was a podium, a microphone, and your pastor. And you, you, the screens for the words or the music. But you just didn't have the, the kind of physicality that we have. And this is actually one of the things that when I finally encountered it, particularly in Latin America, yeah. we have these graphic depictions of the crucifixion and all the rest. The smells and bells there are much heavier and louder, I think, than they, they are here. It made me, it woke me up to something that I'm a human. And, and it, now I look back and say, oh, I'm a unit of body and soul, right? And this physicality attracts me in such an intense way because it gives me an avenue to express this faith that I have interiorly. Hmm. I didn't have that growing up. Yeah. yeah. Did, did it strike you when you were sent down as a missionary into Catholic area that you were there to bring them to Jesus? Yeah, I wrestled with that. Uh, I did, because most of the people, obviously it's a Catholic country, right? Particularly in, in Mexico. And a lot of the people that were coming to our little bodega church uh, were Catholics. They've been raised that way. Oh. And I actually had a kind of a, a struggle interiorly because I was starting to recognize a lot of the truths that were there in the faith. And I think I kind of assuaged uh, my guilt in that over the fact that at least it was a liturgical environment. We were in, you know, it was kind of like Catholic, and but it was it was a struggle. But I wonder also though if that experience was a seed to what you're doing now. In other words, Catholics who look great on the outside, 
or maybe their culture. They, they, they're Catholic by culture, but what's on the inside? Right. You know what I mean? So in a sense, you were, at the time, you were bringing these Catholics into Jesus. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of what you're doing in your new level Catholic Academy. Yeah, it, it is, because I think, I mean, you know, Paul VI and John Paul II and Benedict, right. they all talk about the new evangelization. It, yep. It's, it's that's Catholics, what it is. right? We start with the Catholics. We yep. start with us. And actually, it's not even the people in the pew next to us. It's us. So we have to evangelize ourselves first, and that overflows into the people who are next to us. How many Catholics, we've all seen the percentages of how many yeah. actually believe that the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's shocking to me. And the question I often ask myself is, if I didn't believe that were the case, would I even be coming to Mass? And, of course, we know a lot of people don't come to Mass, right? And so I, I've developed a real... It's not just I want to evangelize people who don't have that mentality. I love those people. Mm -hmm. and, and thanks be to God that they show up and they do go to Mass and they do participate in the sacraments to some degree. And I love the fact that they do that. And what I want to do is help explain, no, you don't understand the treasure that's there and how this can radically transform your life because you weren't made just for this world. You were made for the family of God. You were made for something that's beyond your wildest dreams and that's what you have at your fingertips. Cradle Catholics are the most blessed people on the face of the planet. They are. Think about how you and I were raised yeah. and, and literally having God in that church changes everything. That's what I, that's yeah. like the burning passion that I want to open people's eyes you to. You mentioned that, uh, you know, ca Cradle Catholics are are blessed uh, as a convert to the church. I know how long it continues to take for me to fully realize the sacramental life. Right. It's one thing to believe it as a Catholic, because just the church teaches it and the early church fathers and all that stuff. But to realize it, that's right. That that's Jesus. Cradle Catholics have had that from the time they were a little child. Yeah, and it's something that's just part of them, right? right? It, it's part of their ecosystem from the get-go. And you and I, you know, it, it takes a long time. You can convert, right? Yeah. And you get it here. But it's that seeping in process that takes time. And, and the reality, the incredible reality of what the sacraments bring to the table, I, there are just times in Mass where it hits you. You're like, I'm literally receiving divinity. And what's happening here is I am in the process being made divine. And so, you know, becoming a partaker of the divine nature of God in 2 Peter 1, 4 takes on a completely different meaning and changes the entire trajectory of not just my view of the sacraments, not just my view of Jesus Christ, but recognizing that this is my path in and I'm literally incorporated into this divine life. And that's yeah. mind-blowing yeah. when you think about it. So then we have cradle Catholics who have had this all their life but can take for granted sure. this and, culture. So we've got to help them. Right. So we've got to help converts truly realize it, and then people who've all had all their life truly realize it. That's exactly right. Yeah, this is the one yeah. comment I get constantly when you, you know, I'm sure you've had it too, when you go and you speak somewhere and, and someone says, well, I just love the zeal you have for the faith. And, and I said, no, you're the blessed one. No, I, I just don't know what I have. And I'm like, you're right, but now you do, right? So what are you going to do with it? And when you realize the depth and the richness and the power. Marcus, if we really got the word out about this, the, yeah. the churches would be overflowing. Yeah. That's the fire that, that I want to see in every Catholic because it's, it changes everything. Yeah. It literally is the pearl of great price. Here we are, and I've said this on the program, sadly, probably too many times, but after 2,000 years, statistics say that in America, about 22% of the population say they're Catholic. So if sacraments make a difference to our walk with Christ, 22% of the population say they're Catholic. Now ask any bishop and he'll tell you what percentage of those 22% actually participate in the faith, know the faith, right. living the faith, or benefiting by the sacraments because their heart was truly converted to Jesus Christ. The bishops I've talked to at best say maybe 50%. What that says is, is that one out of 10 Americans, only one out of 10 Americans are in the sacraments. We got a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do.
Now, of course, Jesus only started with a handful of guys, right? And so <laughs> there's certainly hope. But uh, I think that one of the biggest things, and this is one of the reasons why I, I'm, I'm really excited about this Next Level Catholic Academy, uh, is that you can go to the sacraments, but if you don't understand how the interior life is wedded to that, you're done, right? You can receive the sacraments all day long, but the grace that's there isn't going to have its maximum impact on your life. And so that's why this deep prayer life and an actual spirituality has to take place because the only thing, look, when, when the priest elevates the host at the, at the mass, there's enough grace in that elevated host to save the entire world. Yeah. Enough grace there in that one little host, right? And the only thing stopping it is us. Yeah. Prayer is what gets us out of the way. That's why Catholics have to develop this deep interior life so that we get all these roadblocks out of the way so that that grace has its maximum impact upon our lives and we can be transformed. And you realize, man, the, the, the destiny for which I am created and that I'm moving toward here on earth is, it's incredible. <laughs> this is what everything should be ordered to. This is what my entire life should be ordered to. And it just gives you a completely out changed outlook on, on the Catholic life. It's not about rules and regulations anymore. It's about a love relationship with Jesus Christ that changes everything. I was hoping to be able to find it. I don't know if I do. Oh, oh okay. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5.19. 1 Thessalonians 5.19. I feel like we're in a sword drill from our youth. Exactly. What is it? No, no. <laughs> never admit any charge against an elder except an event. No, that's not the one I want. I'm in the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry, folks, wait a second. <laughs> I love that when you do it, especially if you're getting ready to preach on it. Oops, wrong verse, excuse me. Um, rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of the Lord Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Yes. That's right. Now there's a little verse that people just scoot over, doesn't apply to me. That's what you're talking about. That's exactly Do right. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. It's a matter of first understanding that the Spirit's moving in your life, right? And not just when you're at Mass. Because really, everything that we do in the interior life, in the spiritual life, is preparation for that encounter that we have in the liturgy. Like, and, and really, your whole life is ordered to recollecting yourself and moving spiritually forward and listening to those gentle nudges of the Holy Spirit. So yeah, don't quench him. First recognize he's there, yep. right? And then start to be tuned into what it is that he's telling you to do. That's what the interior life cultivates in somebody. So then when you receive the Eucharist, you are transformed and you're literally deified. Yeah, it was interesting that when uh, uh, St. Francis de Sales was asked by a lay woman, I think it was, that led to his writing of the introduction to the spiritual life. You know, does this apply to me yeah. as a lay person? One of the most important things he was teaching is about how to, to hear, to discern those leanings of the spirit. Right. Is it of the Lord or is it of the enemy? How do you know? And if it's of the Lord, you do it. That's exactly right. You follow it. And if it's of the, the devil, you say no. You know, but if it's of the Lord, you, you, you want to hear that, though. You want to discern that, it's, that you are being called. That's that right. he really is acting in your life. And, and there are all kinds of little nuances to the spiritual life that I think this is a, a, a tradition that we've, we've kind of left behind in a lot of ways. And there were a lot of people teaching it, especially, you know, 20th century, but it goes back in the saints, John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila and Augustine, right. you know, Aquinas. All these guys were talking about this. Evagrius, for crying out loud. And they, they, they lay the map out. They lay the path out for us to move through the stages of the spiritual life toward the end goal. But there are all kinds of little road markers and little hints along the way that you, you start to get tuned into the spirit. Like for instance, if you're in an adoration chapel and you're praying and, and you feel this urge to maybe pause your rosary and just kind of set everything aside and just be with the Lord. And a lot of times I think that if, if you're not tuned in that this is something you should pay attention to, you keep plowing through, right? And you quench the spirit at that moment. And you don't realize that what you're doing is actually a negative thing in your spiritual yeah. life. And so we have to be tuned into these things and it's there in the tradition. Yeah. And that it is key, how to, how to help a lay person discern that. Uh, because they can also, those voices also want, want them to feel guilty, want them to right. feel all that. So how do you, as, as John said in first, how do you, how do you test the spirits and make sure that they're guiding? So 
in your journey, we didn't even get you in the church. But, but uh, I'll tell the audience that uh, if you go to chnetwork.org, our website, not only can you read Matt's journey, you can hear his last episode on the journey home, but you can read hundreds of other similar journeys of men and women who've been drawn home to the Catholic Church at chnetwork.org. We'll be back in a moment after the break for the rest of our discussion with Matt Leonard. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and with great pleasure I have as my guest today, Matt Leonard, former Methodist. Uh, the first half of the program, we didn't even get him into the church yet, but again, his, his story is available online uh, when he was a guest back in 2013. Uh, I also want to say MatthewsLeonard.com is your website to find out more about your work and your writing, and also this is all one word, nextlevelcatholicacademy.com. That's right. Here's your new stuff. So we're going to make sure we have time for that. We opened up a lot of good things in the first half. Um, what I'd like to um, mention, you've been involved with three major productions uh, with the St. Paul Center, and, um, and we've got one coming out right now. But there are three themes that are very commonly mentioned on this program over all these years, because often they're barriers to coming into the church, right. and they're, but also they're because they're radically different than, than where we came from. Our Lady, sacraments, and then salvation history. So first, if you would, for the audience, maybe quick on the first two, but talk about how they were a part of your journey and then why they led to why you did these projects and then talk especially about the third one. Yeah, Mary, uh, like so many other converts, Mary was the biggest issue. You know, she was this hanging chad that was there, you know, as, as I'm discovering all the richness and the beauty and the tradition of the church, and I'm like, wow, 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 and they're like, oh, wow, you know? Yeah. Uh, she was hard, she was really difficult for me, and uh, I told this story on the, the last time that I was on your show, Marcus, about how she really intervened in my life and, and caused a miracle in my relationship mm -hmm. with my father. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment when all the teachings about Mary went from here to here, mm. and I realized she was my mother. Mm. And, and of course, that's related to the sacraments. Yep. So the Bible and the Virgin Mary is that first production I worked on for the St. Paul Center, and then the Bible and the sacraments. And of course, if you talk about Our Lady as a mother, mm. then you're looking at, at mm. the whole church as a family, right? And I didn't have that context uh, as a Protestant. Uh, I didn't see, that wasn't the lens through which I looked at everything, even though that's the lens through which God opens himself up as I'm father, right? Jesus is son. And so Mary, as a mother, took me a while to, to figure that one out. And finally I did, and I pray a rosary every day now, and I'm in love with her. And I recognize the value that she has, incredible value in getting us to heaven. But when you see the, the Christian family as just that. The sacraments then are the mode through which we become members of the family, right? So you see the relationship between the two of them. And you and I would call uh, our brothers and sisters in the faith brothers and sisters in the faith, but there wasn't a there there, so to speak. There wasn't a reality there because we desacramentalized everything. But as Catholics, of course, we take Paul very seriously when he talks about how we're all members of the same body and the sacraments are the way through which we become literally brothers and sisters in the faith. And we didn't talk about you know, how I actually came into the church, but I, I came into the Church of Franciscan University. I, I moved there to go through RCIA. In fact, I moved in, moved in with Scott and Kimberly Hahn because they'd known my parents and, and so they invited me to live with them. And I'll never forget on the night that I became Catholic, I'm, I'm sitting in the front row and I was the very first one to receive communion that night. And it was, you know, the 15, 2000, 1,500 people, I don't know, it was packed, right? Yeah. So my local sponsor says I elbowed him out of the way to get <laughs> to Jesus. And I'm like, well, you're blaming me? I, mean, I was, was going to encounter God in this radical new way. And I received our Lord, and it was the culmination of so many years of prayer and study and tears and all the rest of it. And I kind of floated back to my seat, 
and there wasn't even room hardly. I couldn't even kneel down because we were so packed. And so I'm just kind of scrunched like this and praying and focusing on the, the miracle that just took place. And I look at all these people who are coming by me and I realized that I had become part of their family in a way that transcended blood relations. Mm -hmm. And I had members of my family who were at that liturgy and they were so upset at yeah. what it is I'd done, they left at the end of the liturgy, which was very difficult. And I'm not saying that yeah. the Catholics replaced my siblings, but I'd been incorporated into something that was way beyond blood relations. And that's what the sacraments do for us. They, they make us a part of the body of Christ. And Which helps understand that really difficult passage when, when the Lord says you gotta leave these, all these people to follow Him. Yes. He's not saying hate them, no. but He's lifting us to a level of understanding that this relationship with Him is totally different and it's the sacramental character. Something That's else right. struck my mind that you were talking earlier about all the different, if you're going from church to church and church and, and, uh, and it seemed like there was a seed within you trying to grow spiritually, but it did and made me wonder that, you know, Luther had a devotion to Mary. That's right. But the second or third generation Lutherans, that's Catholic, we don't go there. You know, the sacraments, that's Catholic, we don't go there. Um, even in salvation history, no, that's Catholic, we don't go there. So the point is when, when a person is being drawn by the Spirit to go there, they're squelched. That's right. Because that's Catholic, you don't go there. Right. So, you know, in your own journey, you're almost given permission to go there, to recognize Our Lady and her relationship, the sacrament, the sacramental economy, and in this journey of salvation history. You know, I, you brought up the fact that Martin Luther had this devotion to, to Mary, and uh, that was mind-blowing to me. Nobody talked about that, right? <laughs> and when I first went back after that night in Wheaton I told you about, and I was asking these questions, and the authority domino had fallen, one of the first things I did was go back and start reading some Luther and Calvin, and I didn't go through everything, but I started reading some stuff and I thought, my goodness, the Lutherans I know don't believe this, and Luther had a devotion to Mary, and I blew my mind, right? And of course, you keep going back in history, you end up in the early church fathers, and like so many else, you know, you, you end up <laughs> becoming Catholic. But I didn't realize how Catholic Luther was. Mm -hmm. and, and that, it didn't change everything for me, but it made me recognize that, man, the, the tradition that I had received is not even anything like what it is that this guy that I thought was my spiritual father. This new project, Salvation History. Uh, Genesis to in, Jesus. In your, yeah. in your pre-Catholic days, did, was there a concept of that? You know, the, the flow of it? I didn't have it. Uh, you know, I, I was one of those annoying pastor's kids who knew all the Bible stories, you know, better than the Sunday school teachers did, you know, and I could move the flannel <laughs> board around, you know, and, and all that. I, I think I'm sure I, I really caused a lot of them fits. But what I didn't have was the full picture. I didn't have anything to plug all those stories into. And as a grad student, uh, it really didn't happen until I was a grad student going through RCIA that the whole covenantal ecosystem made itself known to me. And all of a sudden, all the pieces of the stories that I'd known from a child, like you know Adam and Eve, and then Noah, and then Abraham, and Moses, and David, and how all these things pointed forward to the church. Yeah. I didn't have that at all. I knew the stories, but once it came together, it was like this beautiful mosaic and everything made sense. All these, these Bible stories that I knew that I'd read so many times, I was like, there was a point to all of that because we kind of avoided the Old Testament in a lot of ways. We were kind of New Testament Christians, you know? Yeah, the, it seems that in general, most Protestants, I, I can't speak, I don't want to be negative, but we really didn't know what to do with the Old Testament except on tithing. <laughs> There was no 50-50 raffle in my church. You just tied 10%, right? <laughs> but we never talked about, speaking of tithing, like in Genesis 14, when Melchizedek meets Abraham, right? And the 10% tithe that, that Abraham gives him. We didn't talk about the fact that Melchizedek offered him bread and wine, which is obviously <laughs> sacramental. Nobody talked about that kind of exactly. stuff. But yeah. the tithing part. Yeah, the tithing part. <laughs> the, um, the, the part that hit me about salvation history, and as I was learning it. Scott Hahn and I were, were in the same class at seminary, right. so we got the covenantal thing. We had that, the, 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 the window hypothesis or whatever that was, but, um, but never in the extent of seeing the trajectory of this is the way God did it with Adam and then the way he did it with Abraham and Moses and David and Saul. So you see this trajectory 
that should make sense when Christ comes, when you don't see that trajectory of the work of the Spirit and you see it as independent little things, then you can end up with a, with a Christianity after Jesus that's congregationalist or that's whatever right. you want it to be, but it doesn't, that doesn't fit that's right. the trajectory of the family people of God. No, because the key there, I think, is the, this whole family, right? And yeah. because all of these covenants that you see in the Old Testament, beginning with Adam, who's yeah. created to be the son of God, right? Every one of these covenants just makes the family a little bit bigger and a bigger and bigger because Adam and Eve were made to be part of the divine family of God. Now they sin, they get themselves kicked out. What does God do? He comes down and he reinstitutes a path to get us back into the family, which we got kicked out of because of original sin, so to speak. And so that it's really just this big genealogy and that happens in through the sacraments. And that's how, and Mary, you know, being the mother. And again, once you step back and you see the entire story of sacred scripture, the story of our salvation through the lens of family life, all of a sudden, you see the role of the Father and the Son and our mother and the fact that you and I are literally joined to one another as brothers and sisters, and you realize we're not in this alone. That yes, there is a personal aspect to our salvation, but the way that I was raised, Marcus, the deeper you got spiritually, the more it was just you and Jesus. Yeah. And that's not the Catholic mode. And, and there's nothing in the Old Testament that speaks to that. No, Me right. and God. That's right. Because entire peoples were suffering the consequences of sin, including us. Yeah. I mean, think about that, even with Adam and Eve. They sinned. I, I didn't commit that original no. sin, and yet the consequences passed down to me. Why? Because we're all part of the same human family that God wants to be part of his divine family. Yeah, the assumption in that long trajectory was if you want to get close to God. Now, we can read it from a non-Catholic eyes. You know, if you want to get close to God, Psalm 15 or whatever it is, yeah, just keep clean hands and a pure heart, right. that's all you need, you know. No, the psalmist was assuming some things. He was assuming that you were a member of the family. Right. If you weren't a member of the family, that psalm didn't make, it, it didn't get you there. You had to be a part of the family. So you see this trajectory. So that's why we have the sacramental system. That's why we have ritual. That's why we have all of this. We have priesthood. Right. That's part of the trajectory. Isn't it interesting though that we were called to go out and evangelize and we're, we're trying to bring people into the faith, and yet what, was, what were we bringing them into, right? Our, our church, small c, and what happens when they left? Are they no longer part of it? Well, no, we, we believe they were, but there just wasn't that, that sacramental reality there that we understand as Catholics. That changes everything. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, um, I remember, yeah, when you're teaching new members classes in your Protestant church, and people are coming from all these different traditions, what do you say? Hmm. Well, we did it this way. Why don't you do it this way? Right. Uh, well, we just don't do it that way. No. Uh, or we try and find some scripture. Right. And make right. sure you get the right one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this new, th the new trajectory for you, uh, the new next level Catholic Academy. Yeah. Talk about that. Especially how does how is that a trajectory of your own journey, if you will? Yeah. You know, coming from a background where Everything is based on scripture. It's soul scripture, it's everything, right? It's pounded into your head. Well, what is scripture really? It's not just this book that has a bunch of moralisms. It's really an encounter with divinity. And, and that's what it's all about. That's what it's ordered to. And so becoming Catholic, it took me quite a while. I don't know what it was like for you, but it took me a while. I mean, you get this ocean of stuff in front of you and you're like, mm -hmm. I gotta read this, I gotta do that, I gotta figure out who that guy is. And, you know, I, I mean, how many novenas can you say in a day? Exactly. You know what I mean? You have to learn. <laughs> Which bones of dead people do I want in my house again? You know, and, and so it was, it was a whole new world that you have to acclimate to in a completely different vernacular. And I think the negative side of that for me was I got so involved for a while in doing those kinds of things and trying to learn everything that I had never been taught that I neglected my interior life. And, and it went off, I don't want to say it went off the rails, but it wasn't the focus anymore because there was so much to learn. And about 10 years or so into my, my Catholic faith, I started to encounter uh, guys like Father Thomas Dubé and uh, 
he the led EWTN the EWTN viewers will know Absolutely. Well, know Just well. his books are phenomenal, and you know, we share a love of the fire within. And, yeah. and that was a book that kind of opened my eyes to the depth of the interior life. And I kind of knew it on some level, mm -hmm. but it ignited, cliche aside, it ignited a fire inside of me that I knew I was created for something more. How do I get there? I have all of the, these tools in front of me. And it wasn't like I, I wasn't growing spiritually and, and really uh, trying to appropriate the sacraments. I was. But there was a piece that was missing. And when I stepped back and I finally understood that being a good Catholic isn't just going to Mass and saying my prayers and getting to confession once a month or whatever, but that there's a whole path down which all these things are supposed to lead me, that changed everything. Mm. And of course, in the tradition of the church, we have the, the three stages or the ages of the interior life, the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive ways. I had no idea what those yeah. things were. Well. In fact, I teach on this stuff a lot. I think that almost every talk I give when I travel around and speak ends up talking about divine filiation, right? How we literally become part of the family of God and, and divine. And these stages are the path through which that happens. The entire life uh, here is a deifying process. And there's a whole path laid out. And when, that, when I realized that, it, it transformed my, my spiritual life because it gave that same trajectory that you see the overall of salvation history. Well, that was the interior trajectory of salvation history for me. And that's what it's ordered to. And that's, that's the fire that burns inside of me that I want to share with Catholics because it changed everything for me. Even though I knew a whole lot, boy, once your interior life changes and you realize the power, the real power of prayer and, and spiritual growth, that's when the sacraments have their maximum impact and, and your world transforms. Again, on my program, I don't know how many times I've, I've talked about this, but I, I've given talks, and I did on the journey home one time, about the, the Beatitudes as a, as a staircase of conversion. And this goes from the spiritual life writers, long before John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, goes back to Gregory of Nyssa, goes back to Pope Leo the Third, or Pope Leo the Great, excuse me, and uh, Chromatius of Aquileia. But the idea is, that in the Sermon on the Mount, our Lord was calling us to a spiritual life, is what he was really doing. He was calling believers, he was speaking to believers, he was speaking to people who are already a part of the family, but they needed to grow right. deeper. And so there's this set, poverty of spirit, mourning, and all that, all the way up to persecution. And, but someone asked me, well, if that was, if, if that was such a, a great way of doing it, why don't you hear that anymore? <laughs> And my answer is that it's because poverty of spirit, which is the beginning, as Father Thomas de Bay would say, is the hardest first step. What is the importance of detachment and simplicity and poverty of spirit to the spiritual life? Well, you think about how do we get healthy in the, in the natural life? You get rid of the bad things that are in your system, so to speak, that are kind of keeping you down, right? And so there's a purging process. And it's the exact same thing in the spiritual life. So we have these sins and these predominant faults and things that are present in our life that are really keeping us from growing. And so that's the focus in the beginning. It's just purging yourself of the things that are keeping you from being able to climb the ladder that you're talking about. And it is hard because it goes against yeah. everything that's inside of us. And everything in our culture says, don't do that. It's all about you. And, and really, it's the opposite. In fact, the deeper you go in the spiritual life, the, really, the more you realize it's really about destroying self-love. And detaching yourself from the things of this world is really the annihilation of self. Not that you don't enjoy life anymore, but you're not allowing these things to control you. You know, uh, John Paul II just had one of the greatest lines ever. He says, you have to first possess yourself before you can give yourself away. Hmm. And, and that's, I mean, yep. think about that. You can't give away what you don't own. And so you've got to be able to take control. That's how you give yourself away. That's what the purgation process is. A rich young man once came to Jesus. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You, you know, what do I do? And Jesus followed commandments. He said, well, I've done that. So in other words, on the outside, he looked great. The outside of his life, he was purged. Like maybe a lot of Christians, you know, you've cleaned up a lot. I don't do this. I don't do that. You know, I, don't, I haven't killed anybody. I haven't stolen. <laughs> you know, I'm good. I'm good, good. Is there anything more? Go. Sell, give it away, follow me. 
he wasn't just talking about the literalness of selling all your goods. He was talking about a deeper surrendering to him. Right? Yeah, you got to get rid of everything. I mean, and I mean, I shouldn't say it that way. I want to scare people, right? <laughs> I mean, because it does. Well, it that's what's probably scary about. Well, it is. Movie. That, that's exactly what it is, right? You're terrified of that God's going to ask you to do something that you're not really willing to do. And, and I get that. And I think we have to step back and remember, going back to this family motif, that God is your perfect father. And so he wants what's best for you. And he always has your eternity in mind. And so the things that he is going to allow to happen to you or the things that he's asking you to give up are really for your eternal well-being. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that we're not supposed to enjoy life. As Catholics, we should be the most joyful people on the face of the earth if for no other reason than all of our suffering has meaning. We haven't gotten all, you know, redemptive suffering or anything. But the things that he wants us to detach ourselves from are the things that are keeping us from ascending to the incredible things that he has. So he says, look, give up something good for something better. Sacrifice the temporal for the eternal. And, and Paul says, nothing on this earth compares. None of the suffering on this earth compares to what it is that God has prepared for those who love him, right? I has not seen or heard nor the heart of man can see what God has prepared for those. That's, that's the point. Something in the Sermon on the Mount was about not worrying about tomorrow. Yeah. Hey, you got enough worries today. But what were you supposed to seek first? Man, the kingdom. Matthew 6, 33, right? And this is one of the verses that was read at my wedding. And it was just kind of like, you know, you have your life verse, you know, as, as a Protestant. That was it for me, Matthew 6, 33. And you seek first the kingdom. Why? Because if you do that, then God will take care of everything else. And uh, I don't want to be like my namesake, Solomon. The S in Matthew S. Leonard is Solomon. And here's a guy who had it all. Think about how wealth and the world took him down. And if there's a guy who has wisdom given to him by God Almighty, infused supernatural wisdom, and he went down. Well, yeah, and you, that really makes an important part, because we're given grace. Yes. And we're not puppets. That's right. We're given grace. And that's why, I know we mentioned this earlier in the program, I've mentioned it too many times, but I'd like you to talk about that statement from Gary Goulagrange, from that mm -hmm. wonderful little book on the three ways of spiritual life, on the, that in the ways of God, he who does not progress loses ground. That's right. Talk about that reality. Well, and Augustine, he's kind of riffing off Augustine, and I mean, who knows who Augustine's riffing off of, but you know, there are no plateaus in the spiritual life. No. If you're not moving forward, you are sliding backward. Because when you think about if our movement, if there's a, if there's a goal in mind, and it's heaven, then you're either going up or you're not. You're, you're falling backwards. And that's why the spiritual life is so vitally important. And I think one of the major differences between now where I am in the Catholic life and where I was as a Protestant, I would put a lot of the, the focus on my emotions. Did I feel like I was making any progress? Even though I didn't have a path, so to speak, to do it, did I feel like I was making progress? Well, when you get into the Catholic spiritual life, there are things laid out for us to do and you realize that, you know, your, your feelings come and go faster than a 16-year-old is licensed, you know? <laughs> and I, I started to understand that the things that are laid out by the saints who have attained the goal for I, what I want to be, I want to be a saint, that these are the things that you have to do. And it's not just a matter of doing them. But I think as the same thing you see in sacred scripture, how God imposes laws on the Israelites. Why? So their hearts would be transformed. That's what happens in the Catholic spiritual life. You do things to grow spiritually, not just so you can tick them off of your spiritual to-do list, but because you're in a relationship with someone who loves you more than you can possibly imagine. That's why you do these things. And that's really what it's all ordered to. Hebrews 12, seek peace and the holiness without which no one will see God. Yeah. I mean, the power of that statement. And this is one of the greatest things about the Catholic spiritual life too, because it's ordered to peace. I, I, that I mean, finding interior peace in the midst of the chaos of this world is one of the beautiful benefits that we have in growing spiritually. People too often look at the negative side of things. There's a positive side of things that's beyond you know, your, your wildest imagination. You can, you can get that peace that passes all understanding here on earth by growing in a relationship with Jesus Christ and putting him above all the things of this world. I mean, who doesn't want that? Yeah, yeah, and that Paul says in Philippians 4 that that peace that passes all understanding as a result of not being anxious, right. rejoicing, presenting your prayers with an attitude of thanksgiving. That's it's right. got to be there. 
that Thanksgiving, which recognizes where it all comes from. You start with Thanksgiving. When you enter into prayer, I mean, really, it's, it's probably the best thing to start with, with thanking God. In the last couple seconds, if they want to know more about what you're, what you're doing, where do they go? They go to nextlevelcatholicacademy.com. All right. Matt, my friend, thank you. It was great, it's Marcus. It's great seeing you. Good you to too. have you on the program. Thank you. And uh, God bless you in this in this new endeavor that you're going out, as well as the the new, what's the new program that just Genesis came Genesis to Jesus. And so you go to genesistojesus.com for that as well. And that's the Salvation History Timeline from the St. Paul Center. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Journey Home. Again, I want to remind you that if you want to find out more about uh, conversion stories like Matt and the work that he's doing and also the work that the Coming Home Network does, go to chnetwork.org and we'd love to be an assistant to you on your journey of faith. God bless you. See you next week.